Okay, so uh, it's my pleasure to uh, to welcome Pedro Mediano, formerly from uh, Imperial College, now a postdoc at the University of Cambridge. As um, as you've heard strongly hinted at from uh, Daniela's talk, Pedro is also going to talk about the, the partial information decomposition, in particular about multi-target information decomposition, which is a, a, a nice new way of thinking about um, I was going to say two-way, uh, two-way multivariate interactions, but I don't think that really captures captures the essence properly. I'll leave it over to, <laughs> to right. you to take it from there. Thanks, cool. Thanks a bunch, Joe. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here. It's a shame that you know we had to do this virtually. It would have been great to do this to see everyone in person in Melbourne. But well, looking forward to next time around. Um, yeah. So as Joe and Daniela hinted, I'm going to be talking about. PID a lot in particular. I'm going to be talking about this multi-target uh, extension to PID that we came up with recently, and we'll see that that uh, extension has a lot of applications to integrated information theory, which is a theory in theoretical neuroscience that we'll be discussing in a bit. Uh, so before we start, I would like to quickly acknowledge people that actually did a lot of this job, especially uh, Fernando Rosas, uh, my colleague from Imperial College, but also Daniel Bohr from the University of Cambridge and Adam Barrett from uh, University of Sussex, as well as a bunch of other colleagues from around the place. Cool, so let's get moving. So let's talk about information dynamics. And it's actually really great to have this talk come up right after Daniela's, because I'm really going to be talking about and building up on a lot of the topics that um, Daniela has discussed. Um, so by information dynamics, what do we mean? Um, so the goal of this field is roughly to study how information is stored, transferred, and modified in a multivariate complex system, um, borrowing this sort of division of storage, transfer, and modification from Joe's work, actually. Um, and I remember when getting into this field some years ago that young Pedro, probably like you know several others in this room, was completely blown away by these amazing work by Joe on cellular automata, right? Where you could get the cellular automata and that have these particles and domain walls and collisions and whatnot. And you could look at specific information theoretic functionals localized in space and time and actually see where and how the computation is unfolding. Uh, and these are some plots that I made myself, but based, you know, strongly based on the plots from Joe's fantastic PG thesis. Um, and one of the things that came up from that work is that um, we have relatively reasonable ways of um, measuring and quantifying both um, information storage through excess entropy and active information storage, and also information transfer through transfer entropy. Um, so those two seem to be, I mean, there's of course still a lot to investigate, but we have reasonable proposals for those, and they seem to be more or less sorted out. Um, but what about modification? When I get into this field, I was really thinking, well, there's something that is really sort of worth studying here, and so there's an open problem. Uh, so how do we study modific information modification Enter partial information decomposition, or PID, um, that was proposed by Williams and Beer in 2010. And you know, you've probably seen this diagram quite a few times yesterday and today, but it's never enough because it's great. Uh, so in PID, mutual information is split into these four disjoint parts. One is called the redundancy, um, and then the unique information and the synergy. You know what they are by now. Um, when you get to higher dimensions, in one two variables, you have to do a bit of work to make sure that these you know that the atoms that come out of PID are interpretable as such as these three things but you can do this um, and for me in particular uh, the interesting bit basically the synergy is where the party's at right because synergy is information that sort of really pulls out from several sources at the same time where information is combined and so you have these irreducible collective effects and that is basically where we think that synergy can help us understand information modification. Um, and in fact, there's, you know, PID has had quite a bit of success in this thing, starting from, you know, a few other talks that we've seen, for example, Marcus talk earlier in the workshop, and also, you know, a long list of other papers since 2010, you know, both at the whole brain uh, level with MEG, uh, and also looking at the different types of neuronal interactions, uh, also looking at a more theoretical concept like neural goal functions, uh, as well as even in sort of artificial deep learning style, artificial neural network has heard artificial twice, but it's fine. Um, so there's a whole bunch of domains in which these you know, ideas of PID and synergy have been applied to, I think with some pretty uh, great degree of success. 
the thing is that actually there's some cases where PD is not enough. And one of them, I will argue, is where you have multivariate complex systems, right? Because one peculiarity of PID is that you always have one big target at the, you know, the top, and then you can have a bunch of sources that feed into this target. Uh, but there's always this big asymmetry between that one target and many sources. Um, and there's many cases, actually, in multivariate systems where there's no natural source and target division. So, for example, if you're analyzing like neuroimaging data, like fMRI or MEG, you're typically analyzing a bunch of multivariate time series and there's no it's not clear which one should be a source and which one should be a target and you could try something hacky like you know designate one as a target and then do some pid on that and then cycle through but that feels a bit hacky um and not only this is um applicate this issue but also from my particular point of view from my field which is consciousness neuroscience there's this other more conceptual issue which is that consciousness is an endogenous process and this is especially obvious during REM sleep and dreams, why your, your brain is completely, well, not completely, but to a large extent isolated from external stimulation. And it's still generating all this very vivid um, stream of experience and awareness, and in some cases, agency, like in lucid dreams. Um, so the goal of this research agenda is how can we describe information flows from the system's intrinsic perspective? Um, so we're very much of this theme. What we're going to care about in this talk, we're going to be dealing with is multivariate systems evolving jointly over time. So I'm going to be using this type of diagram often in the talk, where time goes from left to right. Uh, X will always denote the past, and Y will denote the future of the system. We assume the system is Markovian, and the sub-index denotes which time series we're, we're talking about. Um, and it would be really nice if we could just do a PID on this and we could decompose the information that X1, X2 jointly have about Y1 and Y2 jointly. But PID by itself cannot do this because it cannot deal with uh, multiple targets. Um, now you'll be shocked to hear that we can, in fact, extend PID to, multiple, uh, to multivariate time series. And we'll do this with this construct that we came up with called integrated information decomposition or FIID. Um, and this is the paper that I'm going to be mostly talking about most of today. Um, you can look it up in the archive. It's around. Cool. So very briefly, the take-home message from this talk is basically, you know, we came up with this new extension of PID to the multi-target settings that is applicable to multivariate dynamical systems. Um, and you know, with this tool, we can actually solve no problems within integrated information theory. Um, and in fact, this raises new opportunities and new challenges for PID research. So for the rest of this talk, in part one, I'm going to be introducing this multi-target PID that we call FIID, Integrated Information Decomposition. Um, then I'm going to talk about the relation between FIID and Integrated Information Theory, especially for those of you that you know are into IIT, I'm going to be talking about what's known as IIT2. Um, and in part three, if time allows, I'll talk about a formal theory of causal emergence based on phi ID. But in case I don't actually get enough time, I gave a main a talk about this on the main track uh, with the code 014 that, as Joe said before, you can go and look at the recording in Crowdcast. All right, so let's get cracking. Let's start with information decomposition. Um, and I'm going to start with, you know, I'm going to go back to basics and start with a perspective on PID that's perhaps so slightly not the most mainstream, but that really helped me actually conceptualize and get an intuitive grasp of what these things mean. Um, so when you have just two neurons or two variables for that matter, uh, they can either be correlated or not, and this is measured by the mutual information. Mutual information is zero if these two variables are independent and is different from zero if they're dependent in any way. And that's basically, well, there's a bunch of things that can happen, but by and large, uh, that's what we care about for these purposes. Now, when you have three or more neurons, then fancy stuff starts happening because you can have qualitatively different modes of interaction. Right? So one of them is when you have three neurons and you marginalize out one, that you lose the connection between the other two. Or it could be that you have three neurons and then when you marginalize out one, then you keep the connection between the other two. And this, the one in the left we call synergy, the one in the left we call redundancy. And again, these are, you know, we still have sort of three-way connections between 
you know, both groups of neurons, but they're different in quality. Um, and as a sort of quick, uh, very visual representation, I really like these diagrams with rings. And as an exercise, I'm going to ask you to look at each group of rings and try to mentally remove one of them. And you'll see that if you look at the left picture, that's actually that's known as the Borromean rings. Uh, if you remove one of the rings, the other two are free to go and they're not coupled to each other. Whereas in the right diagram, if you mentally remove one of them, the other two are still very much locked. Uh, so that sort of is a nice and intuitive way, I think, to think about synergy and redundancy in the context of multivariate independencies. A different way of looking at this, and which is going to be a, you know, a bit close to what we're going to be dealing with the rest of the talk, is the PID framework or the PID formulation. Uh, so in PID, uh, we have two predictors at x1, x2, and one single target y. And we can either compute the joint predictability of both inputs to of both sources to the target, or the marginal predictability of each one of them individually. All of those quantified with Shannon's uh, mutual information. And now what happens, and that's sort of quite fun, is that sometimes the whole, meaning the mutual information you get with both variables, can be greater than the information that you get with both of the parts summed. Uh, and this is very much the topic that Williams and Beer set up to investigate. And they ended up coming with this thing that I've called the partial information decomposition of the PID postulate that, you know, as we've seen multiple times today, it splits this, uh, mutual, this joint mutual information into one redundancy, two unique information, and one synergy. Um, and so bear in mind that all throughout, I'm always keeping, you know, the indices, the one and the two, in the curly brackets below refer to the sources, but throughout there's only one single target in all of this. Um, and one simple example, for example, one, the perfect example of synergy is basically the XOR gate, where we have two binary inputs, zero, one, and you have one output, and the output is simply whether the two inputs are the same or not. And in this case, knowing one input tells you nothing, because the mutual information of either of the inputs with the output is zero. Uh, but if you know both inputs, then you know everything. Um, so that means that this, the XOR gate is purely synergistic, that all the information that goes through is fully synergistic and nothing else. So that's sort of intuitive description of PID, like the one we've seen in several talks today and yesterday. Um, let's try, you know, in order to extend this a little bit, let's go and try and distill the key mathematical ingredients that make this, this PID. So to make a PID, we start with an intersection information, I cap. Um, well, this thing is also sometimes called the shared information or the redundancy function. It goes with a bunch of names. Um, and then we also have a, so this I cap, sorry, this basically tells you how much information is contained is shared in a bunch of different sources, alpha. Um, on top of this, you need a lattice or a set of nodes A with some partial ordering such that this shared information or this intersection information grows as you go from the bottom to the top of the lattice. And then with these two things, you can actually uh, form what's called a Mobius inversion. And you can implicitly define these I the delta as well, it's not a delta, it's these I partial, these partial information atoms, and those are what we typically refer to as redundancy unique and synergistic information. Um, and the thing is that when you do this, you end up with an underdetermined system of equations um, whereby the marginal mutual information are given by a redundancy and the unique, and the joint mutual information is given by the sum of all four. So in the left side, we have three quantities that are given by Shannon, and that's fine. But on the right-hand side, we have four quantities, so we're missing one. And that's why it's so hard, there's so much debate in PID to find you know, a measure of redundancy or synergy or whatnot, because we need one extra constraint to be able to solve this system and get the other three elements for free. Um, so when you look at this whole thing, basically when distill, we can get an idea of what are the key ingredients for information decomposition. And those are a lattice, and an intersection information function, or, or redundancy or shared information function, uh, which in PID, the latter is typically denote, uh, denoted with the symbol A, and the intersection function with ICAP, and there's a bunch of proposals for what that might be. Uh, and in PHI-ID, the lattice 
is basically called is what we're known as the what we have called the product lattice and the instruction information is what we have called the double redundancy function so really and then once you have these two you can just do the same uh, mobius inversion business and you end up again with your atoms of integrated information just like you did before so we only need to specify these two ingredients in a suitable way and then basically turn the crank of PID. Um, and to formulate the product lattice, it's actually fairly easy because uh, the nodes of the product lattice are basically, you know, we're going to denote them with this arrow, alpha goes to beta, that basically means that we think of as, you know, from the past to the future. And there's a fairly natural partial ordering between the two. And this is how the creature looks like actually so if you take basically one PID redundancy lattice and you have the Cartesian product with another lattice then you end up with this beautiful creature that is this integrated information lattice with 16 atoms that is ordered in very much the same way as before so you have the double redundancy here at the bottom and the double synergy here at the top and in the middle you have all these fancy things like unique informations or combinations of redundancy and synergy and whatnot that will exemplify in a bit. Um, on top of this, you also need that double redundancy function, which for the time being, which is going to say it has to satisfy a couple of properties. One is this compatibility axiom, which basically just says that it reduces to a PID redundancy or a mutual information and ignore the, well, apologize for the um, weird notation that I haven't introduced. It becomes a bit clear in the paper, which I invite you to go and read if you wanna have a go through this. Um, and then on top of this, we have we can prove this 15 for free lemma that is basically in the same way as in PID, we have Shannon theory. And then when you give me one atom, I can give you the other three for free in PID. Sorry, in Phi ID, if we have a full PID, then you only need to give me one extra atom for me to give you the other 15 for free. So basically this says that as in PID, PID operates as a sort of underdetermined system of equation with 16 equation, well, so with 16 unknowns and 15 equations. That's about it really to define this integrated information decomposition, but how does this thing actually look like? So in PID, there are four terms. There's the redundancy, the two unique informations and the synergy. Um, so in Phi ID, what we have is basically all combinations of past and future PIDs, right? So we have a past redundancy that goes to future redundancy or past redundancy to future unique information, unique to redundancy, and so on, and all 16 combinations of them. So for example, and also to introduce you to how we denote these things, this thing is basically the, so what could be described as the redundant stored information. So there's information that was redundantly shared between one and two in the past and remains redundantly shared between one and two in the future. Then there's also this thing, which is a sort of unique transfer information. That is information that was uniquely in one before and then becomes unique to two in the future. And so far, so good. And then you can actually start getting funky and you can start finding these sort of slightly more exotic forms of information processing or whatnot like for example this that we call duplicated information this is something that was some information that was in one before and then it's sort of broadcast and now it's shared by both one and two right and this is you know one particular form of information one particular information atom that you wouldn't see in normal pid for example and you can have many more of these well you have 16 in total um, to be precise and this is the sort of idea that, you know, these are the sort of information atoms that we can decompose this information flow jointly between these two time series. So let's go through a few examples of these. And in particular, let's start with active information storage, uh, which uh, Daniele already introduced in the last talk. Um, so the active information storage in here, we're going to take it as the mutual information between X1, X, between X1 and Y1. That is, we have time series one or we take the mutual information between its past and its future. Um, so in PID, you could basically just have a, the PID between X1, X2 using Y1 as the target, and then you would decompose this as a redundancy in red plus a unique 
uh, in blue. And then if you have Phi ID, then you can further decompose this into four atoms that basically correspond to this double redundancy plus all combinations between redundancy and unique. And here we start seeing some funky things. So for example, this term in here is a sort of this redundantly stored information that's actually shared between time series one and time series two. Uh, so that, for example, if you were to sum all the information that's stored by the individual time series, you could get something that's higher than the overall information stored by the system because of this sort of redundant storage atom. Um, and perhaps one would argue that the only information that's stored uniquely in N1 in, uh, in time series one is this atom to the right. That's basically the information that's unique to, uh, to X1 and remains unique to X1 in the future. Uh, similarly, we can look at, for example, transfer entropy, which is the conditional uh, mutual information from X1 to, from X2 to Y1. And again, using PID, as sort of Daniela has already uh, used in his talk, we can decompose this as a synergy plus our unique information. And then further on with Phi ID, we can decompose it into, again, four atoms that include basically the synergy and the unique in the past, but the redundancy and the unique in the future. And now we also start seeing funny things, like, for example, this first term on the left that we see is actually symmetric between one and two. So that's information that was synergistic in the past, but is now transformed into redundancy uh, in the future. So for example, if you were to just sum the, mutual, the transfer entropies from one variable to the other and the other way around, you would double count this term. So the transfer entropy is not a fully um, directed quantity because it has this symmetric component inside of it. Uh, and again, like before, perhaps, you know, what we talk about, if, if you really wanted to measure just information that is uniquely transferred, you need to look at this atom on the right here. That's information that's uniquely transferred from two to one. Um, so, so far, that was a sort of theoretical decomposition, which has been playing around with these lattices and decomposing some common functions. Uh, but if you wanted to actually compute this thing, you may be asking, well, how do you compute this thing? What kind of like phi ID measures are around? Um, so what does a double redundancy function look like? And to do this, we can basically draw from this compatibility axiom that we stated earlier. And what we do is, well, we just start from a PID redundancy function and then make a multi-target extension. Um, so for example, we can take, you know, certainly not the most sophisticated, but probably the simplest, uh, the minimum mutual information PID. And in PID, this is super easy. We just take the minimum of all the mutual informations between each one of the targets, between, sorry, between each one of the sources. Uh, and in FIRD, we can make a straightforward uh, extension by basically taking the minimum over sources and targets. And we can prove that, you know, this thing reduces to the PID minimum mutual information and reduces to the normal mutual information in the relevant cases, and it produces a valid FIRD and whatnot. Um, as another alternative, for example, we can look at this um, operational measure of synergy that Fernando and I proposed a few months ago, um, whereby basically the way you calculate this, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail, but the way we do this is we can define synergistic channels as channels that disclose information about the whole of X, but not about any of the parts within X. And then we define synergy as the information that you can extract from a synergistic channel. So in normal PID, like the one we do in that paper, we basically say that the synergy between two sources and one target is basically the mutual information. If you put a synergistic channel on the sources, how much information about the target can you extract through that synergistic channel? Um, and I personally find this measure of synergy quite interesting because it's fully operational, right? So there are, there's been some other attempts at making operational information decompositions, like for example, Abbott's um, measure of shared information yesterday. But for most of the things that I've seen, first of all, they're not applied to synergy, which is the thing that I actually care about. And two, you, they're not fully information theoretic operationalizations. You always have to invoke some form of game theory or Kelly betting or decision problem, blah, blah. This is fully within the realms of operation theory, of um, information theory. You can go full on source coding theorem on this and get basically interpret synergy as 
a bit rate almost through the synergistic channel. Um, and again, you can extend this very easily in FireD by just saying, well, how much information can I take through two synergistic channels, one in the sources and one in the targets? And that will give me this sort of top node double synergy. Um, so these are two measures that we can, for example, easily put up. Uh, but we actually have extensions for a bunch of these, uh, including, for example, uh, Ryan James dependency uh, information, dependency unique information, and for Robin Ince's common change in surprise or redundancy. Um, so as a quick summary of so far, this integrated information decomposition, this is an extension of PID, of PID to dynamical systems applicable to multivariate time series. And it's a basically, it's straightforward generalization of available software and PID measures. Cool. So that basically sums up the sort of core contribution of this framework and we've seen sort of how we define it and what we can do with this. We play around with the measures and decomposing a few quantities of interest. Now let's go and see what we can do with it in the context of integrated information theory. Uh, so integrated information theory, for those of you that don't know, it's a kind of theory of consciousness that's meant to say, well, if I look at the informational properties of a physical substrate of something, say a brain, um, this is supposed to tell me how or whether uh, the system is conscious or is having some particular conscious experience or not. And uh, this thing has been quite influential in the consciousness of science, science community, uh, in particular where I come from. Um, and this thing aims to develop a quantitative measure of consciousness, phi, based on information theory, that allegedly comes from some axioms and there's some sort of philosophical theory behind it, but we're not going to get into any of this. Um, I'm just going to jump straight to this one particular paper which I really, really like, uh, that basically says that, or, you know, it's pushing forward the idea that recent versions of IIT focus on deviations from independence, right? So these two time series are integrated, some are informationally integrated somehow when if I when when I compare the full system with some form of a disconnected system, I lose some information. Um, but the thing is that actually there are many ways in which a system can deviate from independence. Um, so you can compare one system with a disconnected version of itself through, for example, a KL divergence, and that will tell you a number and will tell you if these two systems are the same. But one thing we're interested in here is that, you know, getting a bit more fine-grained detail and saying, well, what are the different ways in which a system can deviate from independent? What are the different ways in which a system can be integrated or not? Uh, so to do that, let's look at one of the early IIT measures uh, that we're going to call here whole minus sum phi or phi WMS. And this measure is basically you compute it very easily with normal um, Shannon meter information. And what you do is you try to predict the future of the system with the whole past of the system. And then you subtract the marginal mutual information. So trying to predict the past of one time series, the future of one time series with its own past, and the future of the other time series with its own past. So this thing is greater than zero for systems that are somehow more than the sum of its parts. Right? So whenever there's some interaction in the system that is not reducible to the separate time series going around, then this thing, this file will be greater than zero. And this thing will be equal to, or importantly, less than zero for systems that are independent or strongly correlated. And there's actually a bit of an issue, and this was actually a problem for a long part of the story of I, the history of IIT, because people were rejecting this question and saying, well, how can that be? You cannot have a system that is negatively integrated. What does that even mean? And this was a bit of a mystery for quite a while, actually. Um, and then we can actually use our integrated information decomposition, our FIID framework, to try and answer this question. So if we look at the formula for this whole minus sum phi, we see that all of these things are things that we can decompose using FIID. We can decompose them in terms of FIID atoms and then just cancel out the ones that are in common between the left bit and the right bit. And when we do that, we see this beautiful result, this result that actually got me really excited, which is that when you decompose phi in terms of information atoms, we see a bunch of things. So first of all, we see a negative double redundancy that is double counted by the two marginal mutual information above. Uh, on top of this, we see basically the sum of all synergistic terms 
And there's basically just a weird way of writing the sum of all seven terms that have a synergy, either in the past or in the future. And then finally, we have the unique information transferred. So it's information that is transferred from one time series to the other, and then the opposite. Um, I really, really like this result when, when we saw it, Fernando and I, because um, this basically sort of puts phi as a sort of dynamical co-information in the sense that you are just taking a reasonable, a reasonable linear combination of mutual informations that basically keeps all a bunch of synergies and interesting terms with one sign, with positive sign, but then double count redundancy on the other side. And this explains why um, phi could actually be negative for systems that are strongly correlated. Um, so if you want this thing to be non-negative, then you can basically just add back the double, redund the double redundancy and you can make this phi C, this corrected phi. Um, and what we did, we tested this on this very, very simple AR process. So here we just have two variables with Gaussian noise linearly coupled to each other. And we are going to be playing around with one parameter, let's see, noise correlation C. So when the noise correlation C is zero, then you just have two linearly coupled Gaussian variables with independent noise. When C is one, these two things are basically fully correlated. Uh, and as we can see on the top of, on the plot on the right, phi whole minus sum actually goes negative as you, so it starts positive for independent noise, but it then goes negative as the noise becomes correlated. Whereas if you add in the double redundancy, this is not an issue, right? So the double redundancy makes it such that, you know, when the system is fully correlated, this corrected phi is just zero. It doesn't go negative anywhere. So we have effectively fixed the problem with whole minus sum phi that people didn't like about this. Um, and not only that, but we can actually keep go on, going on and fixing a few, or at least diagnosing a few of the other problems of integrated information theory. Uh, one of them is that in IIT, there's a whole bunch of measures proposed, but there's no consensus between them. So much like in the PID literature, um, there's a whole bunch of phi style measures proposed to measure how integrated a system is uh, throughout the years. And again, there's still no consensus on any of this. Um, but if you go on and test the test all of these measures on the same toy system with two Gaussian variables that I just described, you basically find that these are all over the place. Whereas right? so there's virtually no two measures. When we tested this on a extensive set of simulations with Alan Barrett, uh, we, tested, we tested a bunch of these and basically no two measures agreed on all simulations. So although they're all meant to capture the same underlying intuitions, in practice, when you go on and compute them, these measures are just all over the place. So in practice, they seem to be very different. But actually, when you go down and decompose all of these measures using phi ID, you find out that different measures capture different effects. And they're different not only in practice, but even in principle. Right, so we can make this table on the right that basically has one row for each phi ID atom, and then we have one column for each measure. We can see that each measure is basically capturing a different set of atoms, right? That explains sort of why a lot of these measures differ in many of these systems of interest, because they're you know it's not that they are trying to capture the same thing, but they're somehow approximating it differently, is that actually they are capturing different information theoretic effects are capturing different parts of the information flow within the system uh, and all of these study was done on this uh, paper that you see on the left uh, that was published a year or so ago a couple of years ago in entropy that uh, if you're interested in integrated information theory please go and have a look at it um, and not only that but also well coming from the so there's analysis before we saw that phi captures fundamentally different phenomena uh, so, for example, we can set up these three different systems that all have the same phi, but actually are qualitatively different. So in one system, we just have a ring copy where one bit of information is transferred to the next neuron. In the system in the middle, we just have an XOR where the value of the middle neuron in the future is given by the XOR of the, all the past neurons. And in the system on the right, it's actually the parity of the whole future of the system is given by the parity of the whole past of the system. So these three systems, they're all, so they all deviate from independence. They're all integrated in some way. So phi 
is all is one is and is equal in all three of these but the atoms that are actually active the, the if you decompose in terms of different integrated information atoms those are different so those give you a much more fine-grained sort of specification of how does the information flow within the system look like so again there may be cases in which it might be convenient to just group all of these things together and measure something scalar and simple like phi but with phi id we have the at least we have the tools in principle to go and open up this measure this big aggregate measure phi and look at which one of these different information phenomena are being expressed in this particular you know in the system that we're looking at um and as a very very quick hint you know, we're at some work in progress we've been applying some of these measures to um, neural data from patients in the what well, subjects in the psychedelic state so we have source localized make data from subjects under the influence of psychedelic drugs uh, in particular we're going to be comparing brains of people under a placebo where there's nothing going on versus brains of people under the effects of LSD um, in some cases having pretty intense psychedelic experiences um, so we can go on and first look at the um, whole minus sum phi and we basically see a very very small difference um, so overall this seems to be a downward trend but it's not clear there's quite a few subjects that are basically uh, opposing the main trend and in general it's just not very clear what's going on however if you go on and separate so you disambiguate between these two components of this corrected phi that includes synergies and transfers and the double redundancy then we see a massive effect in both right now we see that actually phi home in a sum is more or less the same but because not because nothing's changing but actually because both synergy and redundancy are being very very strongly reduced under lsd right so it's not that there's nothing going on is actually the changes in synergy and redundancy sort of cancel out right so this thing of you know trying to open up the measures and dissect them and see what are the, un the underlying components doing there's not merely some like theoretical fun exercise this can actually tell us a lot about what's going on in our data and this can help us get more statistical power on the ambiguity between different conditions and different dynamics in the data that we're observing. Um, so that's a quick wrap up from this part of integrated information theory. With phi ID, we know why phi home in a sum can be negative. We have shown that this sort of analogous to our dynamical co-information. We have a sort of synergy minus redundancy type measure that is easy to calculate, but you have this trade-off that you don't know whenever you see a change, you don't know if it's due to redundancy or of synergy changing, or perhaps both. And finally, phi measures typically um, include a mix of different effects, but can be disentangled with phi ID. And again, if you're interested in this topic, but more from an IIT slash consciousness perspective, I invite you to go and have a look at that paper, um, Measure Integrated Information, that contains a lot of extended discussion about this topic. Cool. Pedro, we're right on 40 minutes now. Um, oh, sweet. I think you said, I think you said uh, this was basically the same as, uh, this last section was basically the same as your talk in the plenary. Was that right? Yes, it is. So it I'm, is right. I'll, I'll leave it up to you if you wanted to give a bit of an overview of this or if you wanted to to go straight to Q&A, but we, we've got about five minutes in total. Okay, amazing. So I'll give a one or two minutes overview and then we'll leave three or four for, for Q&A. Sounds good. Amazing, thanks. Um, so let's very briefly talk about what this work has to do, what it has to say about causal emergence. And in particular, if we go back to the Phi ID lattice and we focus on the top node. So the top node, this is what got Fernando and I interested in the first place. Is that actually, if you look at this double synergy information, this is very interesting because there's information that is, is not coming from any of the past variables specifically, and it's not going to any of the future variables specifically. So there's a sort of some sort of collective phenomenon that is affecting some other collective phenomenon, but it's at no point affecting any of the individual atoms or any of the individual variables within the system. And we basically argued uh, that this double synergy represents some very interesting notion of causal emergence. We have some causal power within the system that is only visible, is only represented at the very top of the scale of the fully collective level. Um, and we sort of came up with this idea 
where you have basically one system X and some potentially emergent feature V, the system is undergoing temporal evolution. And we can provide a, either using FireD and PID and related tools, we can provide a formal definition of causal emergence. We can distinguish between two different kinds of emergence. One is downward causation, whereby this emergent supervenient property is affecting individual um, time series or individual variables in the system. And then the other one is this causal decoupling, which is this double synergy at the top, where you have some collective property affecting some other collective property. And we sort of, we typically think of these as a form of statistical ghost. So some patterns in the data that affect other patterns, but they never actually affect, then they have, they never have any causal power on an individual neuron or an individual variable. Um, and we can propose a bunch of practical criteria and show it in action. And we describe all this in this paper. And as sort of I mentioned before, this is the topic of my talk in the main track with code 014, which you can now go and rewatch. So I'm going to skip this whole section da -da -da, very quick. Some exciting results from the game of life and some motor decoding. Blah, blah. And then just to wrap up, FireD is an extension of PID dynamical systems applicable to multivariate time series analysis, which I think really opens up a lot of new um, interesting applications of PID in cases where it wasn't possible before. Or at least we can make other applications more principled in theory. Um, and FireD allows us to dissect and compare fire measures as well as to make new ones. And we used it to propose a quantitative rigorous theory of causal emergence. And with this, you know, there's a bunch of questions open, extensions, algorithms, applications, and more. Thank you for listening, and please feel free to get in touch if you have any comments or questions. And I'll leave it there and open up the floor for questions. Okay, thank you, Pedro. As I say, as I was saying, give me the audible applause. Uh, so uh, let's let's have a look at the questions now. Obviously, uh, obviously, I like I like that. I've put. Um, uh, put the link to your plenary talk in the comments there uh, for everyone. I also Amazing. put Thanks. an accusation that you were just putting my cellular automata stuff in there as a play for the best DCR presentation award, which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, on a serious note, let's get to the questions. Uh, the first question up voted heavily is, is the code available anywhere? Uh, the code for the synergy measure, the operational synergy measure is indeed available in GitHub. Uh, and I can post a link. Yeah, sounds good. All right, I'll um, I'll put this to. Are you putting it in the main comments there? What do you yeah. want to put on as a comment on this question? That is the code for this operational information decomposition synergy. Um, this operational synergy measure, and the yeah. code for the rest of the FireD uh, that is available upon request. We, I still haven't packaged it and it up somewhere nicely but i'm super happy to discuss and collaborate with anyone so please feel free to send me a line and i'll be happy to collaborate on some code fantastic okay so next questions uh are both from connor actually um so uh -huh. the first question says and i'm not going to invite him on stage because he keeps rejecting my invitations to come on stage Boo. Uh, so he <laughs> says the target chain rule demands that we get uh, consistent partial information decomposition across the various components of a multivariate target. Uh, is this enough, as in having a target chain rule? Is it enough to address your problem with the asymmetry between the source and target variables? Does that make sense? Uh, I can I can add some clarification on what I think he's getting at. If, uh, if you could, if yeah. Not sure. Um, so I, I guess what he's saying is that uh, it would look from, you know, you know how we've been strong advocates of a target chain rule. Mm -hmm. uh, it would look like that would be necessary you know, to have uh, for, for your decomposition working on multiple targets. It, it would look like it would basically be necessary for the, uh, the actual measure of redundancy that's applied on that lattice to satisfy a chain target chain rule in the first place. Um, in the second place, what extra do you get from having the lattice that you wouldn't already get from just applying um, a measure that satisfied a target chain rule on individual target lattices? I think that's what he's getting at. Th does that make sense? Are you getting something extra right. from the multi-target lattice that you couldn't get from the separate uh, separate target lattices if you had a target chain rule? I, so this, the very short and very honest answer is I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> so 
it could very well be that this thing turns out to be compatible with the target chain rule and that if you try to decompose first a conditional and then add the remaining bit then you would recover the same thing um, yeah. i think that could very well be the case uh, but i don't know it would be super interesting to chat uh, and see if we can actually unify all of this in a single yeah, framework absolutely yeah, my, my, my gut feel is that you probably uh, an individual measure would probably have to satisfy the chain, the target chain rule to, to work on this larger lattice. I also suspect there are probably atoms there in the larger lattice that you couldn't get at with uh, individual lattices, even with a measure satisfying the target chain rule. But I don't know what they are. <laughs> uh, right. As you say, we probably have to sit down and, and, and have a bit of a think about that. Um, mm -hmm. But I suspect they're there. It's just not clear what they what they are straight off the bat. Um, yeah, but well, that would be a super interesting exercise. Yeah, I, I entirely agree. Okay, um, we're a couple of minutes over time now, so we should probably stop. There's a few more questions here. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, invite you, Pedro, to to answer them here, maybe afterwards, or we can shift them over to uh, the NeuroStars uh, forum that we have um uh, the, the the comment the, the the question askers can always post them in neurostars and, and pedro mm -hmm. can can answer them there um but we should probably stop so we get a bit of a break before the next session so let's thank uh pedro again for a very interesting talk